Okay, so we are going to be starting on our new unit talking about Manifest Destiny, which we kind of touched on the last time we were in class together, talking about, you know, this idea that God had told uh, the white man that it was his job and his responsibility to move out west and conquer any land that he desired, essentially. So let's go ahead and jump into the notes. So you see, Manifest Destiny, we're talking about how it was seen as righteous. So it was based all on this myth uh, that people in the U.S. were exceptional, that they were great, that they were better than, and much more than the Native Americans who were seen as not having developed the land at all. So they were viewed as not being worthy of it. So it was this belief that God had destined the U.S. to bring order out of chaos, to stimulate economic growth, and to bring civilized living to backward societies. That's what these Native Americans were viewed as being. They were viewed as being backward and uncivilized. So as the U.S. took more and more land, they forced Native Americans onto these things called reservations. And so they were forced to live on land that the U.S. thought to be useless. So they were given the worst land. When white settlers found land, uh, value in the land, it was taken. So they just gave the horrible land and kept uh, the good land. So the country was made without lines of demarcation. It's no man's business to divide it. That's what Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce people said. So the land wasn't actually given back until when? Never. <laughs> so it's crazy. This land was taken from the natives because they weren't believed to be actually doing anything with it. So you see this uh, animation right here talks about the amount of land that is being taken away from the Native Americans. The blue was the Native American lands. You see, over the course of the 1800s, it drastically is stolen and they're sent to all these red areas that are reservations. Okay, so clearing the Great Plains, this US capitalism had started to destroy Native American life because of capitalism, so that need to constantly be making money. So look right here on the this picture on the far right. What does that look like to y'all? It's actually skulls. It is skulls of the bison, which we will talk about in just a second. So a big buffalo almost. So the fur trade had made the Sioux Nation dependent on the United States. So the fur trade had made the Sioux Indians dependent on you know the money that came with trading. So they moved from agriculture to buffalo hunting to remain competitive. So the Sioux Native Americans, S-I-O-U-X, moved from agriculture to hunting buffalo, strictly buffalo. So this made the Sioux more dependent on U.S. guns and ammunition, which was purchased with more hides, creating a vicious cycle. So the Sioux were dependent on the U.S. to have guns, and then they were also dependent on the ammunition, which they had to purchase by killing more bison and buffalo. And this just created a vicious cycle of being stuck and were dependent on the United States. And so the United States took extraordinary measures to keep this uh, dependency. So the Sioux Nation was in a good position in regards to the US and it never lost a battle to the actual US Army. Um, believe it or not, it always talks about the United States just wiping out the Native Americans, but the Sioux Nation had never actually lost any battle to the US Army. But the US Army ordered um, or the US, United States government ordered the U.S. Army to exterminate the buffalo to uh, weaken the Sioux Nation. So the U.S. Army went through and just wiped out all of these buffalo because that is their food source and the economic source for the Sioux Nation. So they were able to kill off the Native Americans through either starvation or through losing their way of making money. So after losing their livelihood, they were literally fighting for survival. And so the largest population of Native Americans after the Civil War lived on what's called the Great Plains. So the Great Plains being in the Midwest, where we looked at like North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, uh, Montana. And so the, there were many U.S. interests tied up in taking this land for the Native Americans. So the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad specula and speculators desire to sell high-priced lands to immigrants and settlers call 
for trails to be made and defended to travel west. So these different interests, the US government had different things that they wanted to ensure was safe from Native Americans, even though this was land of the Native Americans that they were stealing, but they wanted to make sure that they were able to finish this transcontinental railroad. So the railroad that went from east to west, essentially, they had land that they wanted to sell at a high price to immigrants. It's all about making money. And the call for the trails to be defended as you travel west. So they didn't want any of these new ways of making money to be disturbed by the Native Americans. Now, once again, on their own land. But uh, between 1860 and 1910, so over a course of 50 years, the U.S. completely cleared the Great Plains of Native Americans. So over a course of 50 years, all of the Native Americans were wiped out of the Great Plains. And so the Native Americans signed many treaties guaranteeing better land protections for Native Americans. The U.S. signed all these treaties throughout our nation's history from the very beginning in the 1700s. But um, these land, the U.S. was quick to break these treaties when they stood to make money. So they were willing to, you know, sign all these great and wonderful treaties, but they ended up breaking them anytime that there was time to make any kind of money. And so the U.S. signed a treaty in 1868 that guaranteed no Sioux land was to ever be taken without the signatures of at least three quarters of all Sioux Native Americans. So they signed this treaty that said there's no way the United States will ever take any more land Kind of sounds like Andrew Jackson from last year, doesn't it? But uh, we'll never take any more land unless we have three quarters of all the males signed. So the U.S., um, or excuse me, the Sioux were forced to consolidate into the Black Hills region of South Dakota. And then once gold was found in the Black Hills of, of the Dakota Territory, the United States broke that treaty. So the U.S. wanted to exploit the resource-rich land and didn't care that it was on the center of a, the Sioux Nation and their religious shrine and sanctuary. So in the Dakotas, there was a ton of resources like gold. And the United States said, well, we're going to just go ahead and take it because we see that we want it. They didn't care that it was their religious area, this sacred place for the Sioux people. And so the U.S. offered to buy more land um, it was actually rejected. The Sioux Nation rejected it. So they offered to buy the, the Lakota Sioux their land for $1.50 per acre, which is about $424 in today's money. But the uh, Lakota Sioux rejected it. So they were sent in to force them to leave. So the United States, when they offered to buy it for a quarter of what it's worth, they said, oh, we don't we won't buy it. So they sent the army in to force them to leave. And so this is what's known as the Battle of Little Bighorn, aka the Battle of Greasy Grass. So in the Battle of Little Bighorn, this Lieutenant Colonel Custer, C-U-S-T-E-R, launched a surprise attack with 700 U.S. soldiers. But he uh, launched an attack on a village of 8,000 people with about 1,500 to 2,000 of them being actual fighting people. So that means that 6,000 people were either women, children, or elderly that couldn't fight. And so over half of the U.S. soldiers died, and Custer committed suicide with his last bullet. So the United States got wiped out by the Native Americans in this sense. But Custer, his death really got the U.S. and the Sioux, um, it got the U.S. to now come in with full, full force and wipe out the Lakota Sioux. So the United States, because they lost a battle, sent in even more soldiers and forced them to leave their lands without even a choice. Didn't give them any choice at all. Okay, so this gets us to the Dawes Act, which we covered a little bit last week in class. So the Dawes Act passed and authorized the president to confiscate and redistribute Native American land. So literally the president could take confiscate and redistribute, hand out Native American land to anybody he wanted to. And so as the land was taken, the Native American political systems were destroyed. So this destroyed the structure that the Native Americans had. 
the chiefs were no longer recognized and the treaties were completely broken. The United States broke all the treaties that they had made with the Native Americans. So they saw that it was taking too long to get the Native Americans to leave their land, so they just started taking it. And so the U.S. handed out uh, the land into individual plots in an attempt to destroy Native American culture and society. That's what we talked about, assimilation. So the goal was to encourage Native Americans to become farmers in the way that white Americans had farmed. So take away their way of life and Americanize them, make them into white farmers. And so um, they wanted to Americanize them by forcing them to disavow their traditions. So the Native Americans who accepted the individual plots were given US citizenship and the remainder of the land was then sold off to white settlers. So the Native Americans who accepted the um, culture and language were seen as cause for the US's Indian problem. So Native Americans who kept their culture, kept their language, were seen as the causes of this U.S. air quotes Indian problem. So Native families were forced by the federal government to send their children to Indian boarding schools. So essentially they were forced to send them to boarding schools, which is like a school to completely reshape their views in life. So the Natives were taught the habits, air quotes, and arts of civilization while encouraging them to abandon their traditional language, culture, and practices. So you can see this is one Native American young man. This is what he looks like with his Native culture, his Native dress, his Native hair. And then on the right was what he looked like afterward. He was forced to cut his hair, wear American style clothes, and essentially give up his entire heritage. So their long hair, which is a source of pride for many Native peoples, was cut, and their tradition, traditional clothing was exchanged for uniforms. And so they even were forced to change their names. They were forced to change everything about them. They were taught that their own culture was inferior and that they should be ashamed of being Native American. And they were punished if they spoke their Native language and if they refused to... Um, convert over to Christianity. So if they didn't convert over to Christianity, they would be punished. So this is where we get to desperation, these last hopes that were dashed. So we see that with life looking as desperate as ever, the ghost dance movement gave some in the Sioux hope for a better life. So the hope was to reverse the devastation that had been given and wrought to all the Native Americans, especially the Lakota Sioux. So the center belief was that if the rites, rituals, and practices were followed, that dead Native Americans would be brought back to life, the buffalo would become plentiful again, and a natural disaster would wipe, would wipe white people off of the continent. So they believed that if they com committed this um, Native American ritual, that they would be able to then be successful, that they would be able to wipe the white man off of the continent. And so... The white settlers were concerned with this ghost dance movement and informed the government, which um, fearing it, uh, the government reacted so strongly because they feared that the uh, Sioux would try to, you know, fight back and start a war against the native or against the United States. So this led to what's known as the Wounded Knee Massacre. So the U.S. outlawed the ghost dance and sent out the army to relocate the Sioux and arrest their leaders. So we get to the Wounded Knee Massacre. So in this, the United States um, went out and targeted the group leaders of the Sioux, which was Bigfoot and Spotted Elk. And so the Army's intention, um, they began moving in uh, to this tribe to not, excuse me, I'm sorry. So the United States started trying to attack Bigfoot and Spotted Elk, which were leaders of the Sioux, because they were trying to unite all the different tribes and the different peoples, all the different Native Americans to join together as one. And the United States saw this as a threat. So, you know, these two leaders were both in their 50s. They were really old. And so they, were, uh, they weren't a huge threat, but the, yet the United States found the group and they marched them five miles to Wounded Knee Creek, which you're gonna, you see right here in this picture is what's gonna happen. 
They found the group. They marched them five miles to Wounded Knee Creek. And there the cavalry began to disarm the Lakota, the Native Americans. They took all their guns. But a gun went off. A gun, you know, fired accidentally. And the United States began killing every, all of them. All the people that they found, they started wiping them out as kind of punishment. And so at least 200 Lakota were killed, including women and children. But, you know, we can't even know the exact number that were killed because they were put into this massive grave. You know, all the people that they killed were piled up into this massive grave and then buried. So there's no way of actually knowing how many people were killed. So this is just one example of many of how the United States reacted horribly to the Native Americans. They saw them as a threat, even though the United States was the aggressor. The United States was the person who came in and committed these horrible acts against the Native Americans for simply existing. And so we're gonna leave off our lecture right here, but I want you to take away from this. The main things I want you to take away from this is how the United States, what did the United States use to justify committing these horrible acts? So think about that while you're finishing up this lecture. Go back, you can uh, listen to the rest of the lecture again. It's not that long of a lecture, but go back and think about what, how did Manifest Destiny tie into these horrible acts that the United States committed? So we'll discuss this the next time we're in class. Thank y'all.